He's the fellow who's getting up very slowly. I just thought this might be an opportunity to personally thank people in the faculty and the students who were such a support uh, during this time. Uh, particularly, I want to thank some students who, about three weeks ago, I was really uh, not feeling like I was going to do much. And I got this card out of the blue from a few students, and it meant really a big thing to me. And uh, the only thing else thing I wanted to say is that uh, I'm starting, doctor says I can start class this week, and that uh, I can start laughing in three weeks. <laughs> when Paul comes back, those of you who are in his class will have no reason to laugh. So be ready. Uh, it's my pleasure, and you can tell it's a momentous occasion because my tie is all the way up to my neck for a change, uh, to introduce our speaker tonight, Malcolm Wells. He is a lecturer, a writer, an architect, a cartoonist, a columnist, a solar consultant, and I think equally importantly for the reception afterwards, he seems to be a very nice guy and easy to talk to. So that's another reason to come to the reception. Uh, he is, has been on the Governor's Pinelands Commission in New Jersey. He's founding director of the Mid-Atlantic Solar Energy Association and New England Solar Energy Association. He's had over 500, count them, 500 mouth-watering commissions all over the world. That's disgusting. He's been published in PA, Architectural Review, Japan Architect, House Beautiful, AIA Journal, Harper's, on and on and on and on and on. He has books on energy design, energy essays, pardon, underground designs and general architecture, which are available outside for your purchase. And if they run out, you can order others. Uh, he, has, he is a star of television. He's been on the Today Show. He was, he was unveiled on To Tell the Truth, okay? But he did receive, I understand, some luggage and some other nice gifts, okay? He has, he has lectured in 29 states, since that's over half. The states he has not lectured in are Arizona, Hawaii, 19 others. I can't remember all the states, okay? But uh, it is my pleasure to present to you tonight, for your enjoyment, Mr. Malcolm Wells. Well, uh, can you hear me, folks? Yes. That was the best introduction I ever had, and it was all lies. <laughs> of those 500 commissions, uh, I think about 50 went ahead. So it isn't quite the way it sounds. And besides, I've been practicing for 27 years or so. So you'll do far better. The, the point of this whole thing tonight is to say that you do do a lot better than I ever did because I was about 40 before I ever had a single thought in my head and that's a little late to get started. Uh, I'm not too happy about being an architect most of the time. I rented a car today at Indianapolis Airport and drove here and for about half of that trip I wasn't too happy about other architects either because it's pretty bad. It's just like New Jersey where I grew up and Massachusetts where I am now. But uh, then I saw something pretty nice this evening and made me feel good about architects again. I saw Professor Dr. Mr. Underwood's house. Uh, it was very nice. Well, lecture time. 
May we have the lights off and the pictures on, please? Let me see. This is what I don't like. One of the things I don't like about architecture, even before I knew about what it was that buildings did, I was disturbed by the false frontiness of it all. And I guess you are too, but you know that the fronts don't look like the backs most of the time. Whoop. There we go. Another front and a back. Cape Cod, Massachusetts, where I live now. I guess there's nothing criminal about that. It doesn't really matter what the back of the building looks like. But that kind of thinking has shaped a lot of us. And I guess it shapes a lot of you in your work. It's really a shame because we should stop fooling ourselves and each other. This is a, a bank near Fargo, North Dakota, and this is the back of it. Now listen, uh, it's sort of nice and quaint, and it's a lot of fun, but it was designed by an architect, someone who presumably graduated from architectural school and was licensed. To, well, it's a little disappointing, but it is rather harmless. Another thing about this Cape Cod building is that, as you can see by the little hill in the distance, that it was sort of cut into a hillside. And they could have made that building a little more of the earth than it is. Perhaps a little more like that, which happens to be my house. And I'm going to show you 400 pictures of that later on. But there is a better way than, than the brick box, I suppose. And we're going to have to learn to do something to make things a little more palatable. Maybe this is the direction in which we're going to go. I don't know. Maybe that's the direction. At least that's what Newsweek seems to think. The New York Five are quite big now. But I suspect that we're not going to go in any of these directions. We're going to go this way, the way New Jersey has gone. It's coming here from Indianapolis, and it's going into Alaska, and it's everywhere. And this stuff is being done by architects. People like you, 10 years from now, are grinding out this stuff because, well, they can make money at it, or because they don't care, or know better. But you do know better now, so you, you can't do that stuff. Another thing that's terribly disturbing is what we do when we build, during the act of construction. It's a whole other story from what buildings do after they're completed. But a lot of the site damage and environmental damage and resource waste goes on during that brief period. It's really a vicious thing that we do to land in the name of architecture. And I believe that it is impossible for you to draw a single line on an architectural drawing that does not have connected to it uh, the sacrifice of some living creature. Now, I know that uh, whenever you click your teeth together, you're killing something. We have to kill in order to live. But most of it is so mindless. If we put an extra two by four in a wall or move a single contour on a site plan, we're killing things, perhaps unnecessarily. And those things are not stupid accidents. They're beautiful miracles that have been here for eons. Well, you get the picture of that. We've done that for too long. This man, the owner of the building, believes that you can't see his air conditioners because of the landscaping. <laughs> Now, that's true. It, most people do not see those air conditioners because of the landscaping. But it's a terrible exploitation of a living creature to try to cover up human mistakes. That building was designed by an architect. And this was designed by an architect. Now, I, I was recently at a university in southern Louisiana, which shall be unnamed, but they were really a backward group of young architects there. I know that you are different. I'm not kidding about that. I've seen a little of what you've done, and I've talked to a few of you, and been around here a little today. And I know that you are aware of important things and are doing some good stuff. But still, you, most of the time, 
are not too enlightened, because none of us are. Most of the time we operate at that sort of nitwit level, and yet we don't believe it. We, we have our diplomas and our degrees and licenses which tell us that we're experts, so we do the most frightful things to this planet because we think we have the right to. This is the way we save energy. It really beats the heat loss when you do that. Anyway, folks, remember this when you set out to do that great project, that this is what you are, and it's what I am. So don't believe too much of what you hear. In 1955, as a brand new architect, I built this building for myself in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And I thought it was the finest thing ever designed. It has no insulation, insulation whatsoever. All of the rain that falls upon it runs off into the storm shore. Of course, the sewage goes right into the river. It just about does everything wrong. The largest glass is on the north side. It's not insulating glass. And yet, because of my growing guilt and, ins and uh, interest in living systems, I began to do a lot of landscaping there until 20 years later, that building was almost hidden with vines and trees and shrubbery. And I succeeded in fooling all the people of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, into thinking that I was the conservationist architect. And even now, after I've been gone four or five years, they still talk of that as the conservation building. And it's just pure window dressing. It's utterly phony. Now, I did not design that building, but you can see at a glance that its roof is honest about the lack of insulation. It doesn't fool anyone, and that's better, I think, in a way, honest architecture. I've done jobs in various parts of the country. This happens to be Arizona, in case you don't recognize it, where they have a lot of heat in the summertime. So I knew instantly what to do in Arizona. I used wide overhangs, but I slatted them so that the hot summer sun came right down through the slats and burnt everyone up. And then, this was in my hot shot days. This is in uh, Massachusetts. I put the uh, sun fins on the building on the south side, where they did no good whatsoever. But the effect was nice for a while. It was just mindless, aimless architecture, searching for forms that would be pleasing. And meanwhile, I was making a lot of money designing industrial boxes all over the country. Terrible stuff, wiping out farms and forests, putting in huge air conditioners and boilers, just looking for something that was different. Some of it looked nice, some of it didn't, but it was just shameful stuff. And then I started to think about earth and indigenous plants, things like that, and started to get away with a few things. Without spending any extra money, I could put in percolation beds and ground covers earth shelter, things like that, and they started to go over very, very nicely and easily. And everything seemed to thrive. Wildlife came there, the trees grew quickly because it seemed to be the right setting. And I knew I was doing something right, and then I thought about underground architecture, because in South Jersey, where I was practicing, everything is asphalt and plastic, and shopping centers as far as you can see. So before I plunged into underground architecture, I went to Plainview, Texas to visit Jay Swayze, who had built a house under this garden on your left. Thirteen feet below that little plot, there's a concrete vault inside of which he has built a Cape Cod cottage with plastic flowers in the window boxes and electronic sunsets on the walls outside. It was just horrible. There, there was no sense of season or weather or night and day, nothing, just utter silence, no dust, and I, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. It's not my kind of underground architecture. I believe that our priorities ultimately must be these, plants first, because they have no other place to go, and then we and the machines can fight over second place, but the plants must be first, even though all of us are taught to destroy them. Even a lot of landscape architects are, are taught to destroy natural sites. Of course, engineers and contractors and developers are all 
bent in that direction too. A lot of people think that underground buildings have to be something like this. And architects think they're something like that, apparently, because Hmm. Well, back in 1964, when you were all toddlers, I started promoting this stuff, and it fascinated people. They thought it was wonderful, but no one was ready to build any of it. The underground suburb, underground classrooms, a little underground house that everyone marveled at. Oh, wonderful, but it never got built. And for about 10 years, I was grinding these things out, an underground cocktail lounge with a swim-in entrance. That's the museum of the future. Underground parking, rooftop planning, solar heating, all that nonsense. Great stuff, but still it was not getting built. Ah, New York City and the Philadelphia Bicentennial, still not built, luckily, because those things were loaded with so many foolish ideas, I'm just thankful that they never went ahead. Uh, back to what we are again. We've got to remember this. <laughs> See that? It just goes on and on. It's all over the country. So remember that when you design. This is a view of Mount St. Helens just after it went off. And, no, that's sewage, which you see happening now and then around the countryside. This eruption occurred on a piece of barren subsoil near Cherry Hill, New Jersey, in the spring. And two weeks later, that's where the grass was growing because of the nutrients. Now, there's a marvelous lesson in recycling and resources, sewage treatment, the whole business, and yet it's completely wasted on us. We continue to dump those riches into the rivers, where the rivers are destroyed by them. Lessons are everywhere around us. This thing, the miracle of green plants always trying to come back, that silly thing on the right is the result of a few pieces of grass seed dropped between some stacked boards. And even there, they popped out, trying to tell us that that's the way it's supposed to be. If we all go away, that's the way the whole world will look again. This is my porous paving section. You know about that, I'm sure. It's great stuff. Very expensive, back-breakingly heavy to put in place, but it's so nice, so pleasant. It lets the rainwater percolate instead of running off, and it's a little bit of a gesture toward the big system. Now, you don't have to read all that, but it does seem to me that the wilderness system is nearly perfect for recycling and solar heating and habitat and weather moderation, the whole business, including being beautiful. I've got a big mistake coming up on this list, but first of all, this would be a mechanized modern farm, and you can see how far down the list it is because of the way we've turned our backs on natural systems. And then we come to this building, which may be about right. I was afraid that we would be meeting in the new solar building. Are we? Where are we, anyway? Oh, we are in the new solar building, which I'm sure gets a better score than this. But except for that, this building and almost all buildings get terrible scores today. And then when you go all the way downtown, it's just about a total wipeout, all because of architects and planners and builders and engineers. We're a bad, bad bunch, no matter what anyone says. And almost no matter what you learn here, you're going to be pulled by all sorts of forces, and temptations, mostly the money ones, to do dreadful stuff. And I guess you'll have to succumb to some of that. But you'll find that if you dare not to, that you can get away with it. I'm I'm amazed at my own cowardice and at the number of times I folded in, folded up and gave in to, to clients and to other pressures, simply because I thought I had to. Well, you don't have to. If you dare to do something, you can really get away with it. And even if you don't, you're glad that you tried. That is called strip mining. It's the mentality that runs us, digging the minerals out of the earth, throwing them into the sky or into the river and then 
over farming the land and finally building upon it and paving it. It's the architectural specialty. And I think a lot of the new stuff we're doing, a lot of it, almost everything that's built in this country is strip mining. It's dreadful stuff. Now, for the commercial, we do have the potential right now to build in such a way that we can use almost totally renewable resources over and over again for our food, for our heat, clothing, shelter, everything. It is possible. We can do that. And yet we're such a long way from there. Well, back in 1971, I finally broke down and built a building for myself underground. Two little buildings, in fact, facing each other across an open courtyard. Reinforced brick walls and a concrete roof. No insulation. I simply wrapped the buildings in rubber sheets and thought that the earth would do all the weather buffering that needed to be done. Well, I found out better, but I put a lot of reinforcing in that building so that my first one wouldn't collapse. It's designed to carry a forest of mature New Jersey trees on its roof. And we could drive a bulldozer out on those seven-foot cantilevers without any noticeable deflection. It's really built. There are the rubber sheets, butyl sheets, a sixteenth of an inch thick, glued on completely. They're so tough that you can hit them with the point of a spade, and it doesn't even damage them. And they last either permanently or eternally, one of the two. <laughs> but they're guaranteed for only five years. <laughs> uh, these are backward. You have to look at the one on the right first. These are the same scene, by the way, four, four months later from right to left. The site of that first funny little building of mine, underground building, it was simply uh, backfilled with, with subsoil, no topsoil at all. And then we put about six inches of street collected leaf sweepings or fallen leaves as mulch. And four months later, it looked like this. The wildflowers simply took over. And it, it's just a marvelous sight to see what natural elements do when you give them a chance. The wildlife moved in. That, that little site is crowded in between a house, a parking lot, a six-lane freeway, and, and the sewer. And somehow, we had all kinds of wildlife moving in there because it was the only wild spot in the neighborhood. Migrating waterfowl and raccoons and squirrels and snakes and rabbits and the whole business, plus hundreds of birds. There at that dinky little site because it looked like home to them. And that, to me, is the only endorsement needed. The main mistake I made, of course, was not in not insulating. And not only that, I had these continuous indoor-outdoor surfaces, which tend to get blue when they're cold, as you can see. Anyway, my first thought was to wrap that mistake with insulation. And that is not the way to do it. We've accommodated mistakes long enough. Apparently, the way to do it is to insulate the outside of the structure over the waterproofing, to use freestanding sunshades or trellises, and to have movable insulation for the windows. That's more or less the basic way to insulate a small building these days. We know better than to insulate inside now. It just makes sense, and yet so few of us are doing it. Ah. Now, if you'll bear with me. <laughs> Do you know of this magazine, Coevolution Quarterly? It's published four times a year, as most quarterlies are, by <laughs> the editors of the Whole Earth Catalog. It's the best magazine, or one of the best in the country. It just covers everything. In this new issue, there is an article by Paul Ehrlich, the population biologist, having to do with the uh, the whole mess. And I'd like to read two little sections from it to you, because it has to do with architecture, even though it doesn't mention architecture at all. And we'll be out of here in 14 minutes. Humanity should be extremely conservative in its treatment of Earth's ecosystems. For every release of a toxic substance, every plowing under of a field, every filling of an estuary, Every cutting down of forest, every forcing to extinction of a population or a species threatens the integrity of society's life support systems. While the current state of ecological science cannot predict with accuracy the consequences of any given act 
or extinction, it can predict with extreme accuracy the end result of continuing our assaults on Earth's systems, the collapse of civilization as we know it. Suppose you saw a group of people prying rivets out of the wing of an airplane you were about to board. Imagine also that you didn't know the exact details of the airplane's construction, but were aware that the loss of some rivets wouldn't necessarily cause the wing to fail. Would this make you relaxed about the prospect of flying in that airplane? Would you be satisfied if you asked one of the people to stop prying out a rivet, and that person simply said, you can't prove that the loss of this rivet will fatally weaken the wing, so it's perfectly all right for me to take it out. Would you be relieved if he said, don't worry, see, I've just taken out the rivet and the wing hasn't fallen off? You would, of course, have to be insane to fly in that airplane after such a conversation. Needless to say, the treatment of that imaginary wing bears considerable resemblance to the present treatment of the life support systems of spaceship Earth, except that we have no option as to whether or not we'll fly on her. Just a little more. Yet the vast majority of Homo sapiens goes merrily on its way, popping rivets, exterminating, exterminating populations and species without the vaguest notion of the probable consequences of such behavior. But we can at least be sure that those consequences will not be pleasant. They can be expected to include the further collapse of fisheries, enormous outbreaks of pests and parasites, the advance of deserts, erosion, the exhaustion of fresh water sources, the progressive failure of high yield agriculture and forestry, and rapid climatic changes. These in turn will induce catastrophic famines, plagues, and probably thermonuclear war. Well, kids, that's really what we're facing. And architecture has a lot to do with that. Not in a statistical way, I suppose, but your attitudes are going to count for a lot. Because if people see buildings that are obviously different, that express a concern about this land of ours, it's going to move a lot of people. Imagine having a, a school that looks like a hillside or a wildflower garden instead of these factory boxes that we put our little kids into. Well, no. Now, that's called contour farming, and to me it expresses the idea of caring, husbandry. And I think we can have an architecture that begins to express those kinds of ideas. We can do it. We can have buildings that are soft-looking and friendly and charming and appealing instead of the horrible, boxy stuff we're building today. Ah, now we come to the Wells House on Cape Cod, house and office. It's one room wide and 110 feet long. I work there alone. The red arrow points north. The blue arrow is the entrance, and the yellow arrow is the office end of the building, which happens to be the south end. As you can see, the house faces the wrong way. It doesn't face any way except upward, really. It has earth on the flat part of its roof. There's a vegetable garden in the circle. And I'm beginning to suspect that the most significant thing I'm discovering there is that wildlife predators will not go inside that ring garden. There's just a four-foot-high mound of earth around the vegetable garden, no gates at the openings. All the neighbors are plagued with woodchucks and squirrels and rabbits and deer, and not one goes in the ring. So maybe there's something magic about it. Well, anyway, it's a, a long heavy timber A-frame, concrete and local timbers. There are holes through the support piers for an underfloor duct. And that's sort of the way it goes. Timbers on tops of those things. Get the picture, eh? The house is oriented exactly on the pole star. So it's a due north-south house. And at exactly high noon, we get beautiful shadows right down the center of the building from the skylight. The idea is that as the sun goes over the building, we try to pick up from whatever heat we can get from it. And there it is. We get the morning sun from the east, the midday sun from the top, the late day sun there, and then all the heat is pulled down by a sniffer duct system through a, an underfloor bed of sand. There are 
uh, no, reflectors up top and plastic pipes underneath. The sequence of the floor sandwich coming up from the bottom is water vapor barrier, mud slab, four inch plastic pipes, a foot and a half of sand, and then the finished working living slab, finished slab. Now all summer long, we sniff down the hot summer solar heated air from the tops of the room. 95 degree air is being sucked down, blown through the pipes in this huge sand bed, and it comes out no warmer than 75 degrees. Now I have no idea where all that heat is going because uh, the floors aren't noticeably warm. The floor slabs are at about 70 degrees. We've been in there a year and I suspect that we're just building up a big heat bubble under the house, but it certainly is a nice thermal flywheel. The solar heating works very well, except on days like that. That's a picture of wildflowers on the roof, roof edges. One thing about these little beauties, though, is that you can be fooled when you're on top into falling off the edge, and little kids are tempted to climb upon them. So I reluctantly put fences around the buildings and then try to hide the fences with shrubbery. You've got to do that if you want to stay out of trouble. You've also got to make sure that the building is structurally sound. A lot of people assume that concrete has infinite strength. They also build bedrooms way back into hillsides where there are no exits other than, than the one from which you entered. Bad news, you've got to build safe buildings no matter how you build. One of the things I learned was not to use parapets with earth-covered buildings because they're damaged by ice, they're heat bleeders, they're just terrible. I used to propose building buildings like that. Can you imagine that gross monster that would have bled all the heat away and caused all sorts of leaking and thermal problems? But luckily, I was kept from doing it. One thing I did learn, though, was that Reynolds wrap is really cheap and effective if glued on a brick wall or on any wall. It acts as a heat reflector. You just spread linoleum paste, spread the Reynolds wrap, squeegee it off with a sponge, and there it is. You can use it on the insides of dormers to bounce more light into rooms. You can use it in solar collectors, greenhouses, anywhere. It's one of the cheapest and most cost-effective materials you can use. Another thing I'm hoping to learn is to base some designs on natural models, because there are some gorgeous things around us that don't look at all like some of the stuff I saw on the way here from Indianapolis today. We're surrounded by marvelous structures and systems and organic designs that just have all sorts of possibilities for us. In 1964, I designed a building for the World's Fair in New York. It was to be my greatest work, a composition of circles and simple geometry and rich materials. And well, it didn't quite turn out that way. And that was the year of my conversion, as a matter of fact. And I began to see that this throwaway architecture was not quite the answer to anything. Bad stuff. This was an underground airport, which uh, isn't too practical, I guess. I found that people tend to sneer at the idea. They don't sneer at insulation, though. That is the key, I believe, far more than solar heating or wind power or any of those exotic things. If you insulate properly, you're about three quarters of the way there. It just does a marvelous job and covers up many of our mistakes. Not too many years ago, the building on your left was more or less presented as the ideal way of designing small building. Large overhangs on any side, no matter which way they face. Large uninsulated glass areas, heating pipes that would leak heat out through the foundations great heat-wasting fireplaces. You know the whole thing. Now we know better. We know that we should perhaps have earth cover, solar heating, outdoor reflectors, indoor shutters, efficient stoves or heaters, thermal mass, all of those things. And yet most of what we do with those things is dreadful, awful looking stuff. So that's perhaps where your greatest challenge lies. And taking these things we know today and making them presentable so that they sweep this country before it's too late. Another thing I learned was that a house with a long skylight like mine gets very hot in the summertime, but that canvas covers are quite cheap. They just pop on and pop off 
in about 10 minutes. So that's something to keep up your sleeves if you find your greenhouses overheating or things like that. Underground building and another underground building. There's quite an extreme range of designs possible. And I hope that you'll do some that aren't too ugly. I think there's something very dramatic about walking or driving into a hillside and perhaps seeing a lighted courtyard ahead. And yet most of us are doing things that aren't too exciting, apparently. The possibilities are limitless. And yet a lot of us architects I'm talking about, not just do-it-yourselfers, architects are dragging suburbia underground in that way, trying to force it to be something that it isn't in the hope that by going underground or by adding solar panels, we can continue to live in the same way we've been living, which just can't be. But the possibilities are quite limitless. This is the way we used to cover buildings with plants, but it was not the right way. We can do so much more. We can actually let things go wild and free on top. We can perhaps have buildings that may be a little bit phony at times, but I measure a lot of their success now by how they actually work, whether the plants and the wildlife accept them. You can build on the surface and cover, you can dig low, you can build in hillsides, you can do all, and you don't have to go underground, of course. I don't really mean to stress that quite as much, but there, we've got to do something better than what we're doing. We're doing trash and junk in the name of architecture. Well, here it comes, folks, and you're the ones who can stop it. You can have wildflowers on all the roofs in town that change with the seasons and take care of themselves, or you can have that plastic mess of New Jersey as the good old days that your children look back upon. But whenever you see a vent pipe coming up through the grass, you know that something good is going on down below. So. Keep that in mind, folks. Ha! Ah, that's it. any questions. I'm sure you'll see the direct parallel between this lecture and Stanley Tigerman's a few weeks ago. I mean, it's just part of our continuing program in, in, in one attitude toward architecture. Okay. Professor Lasso. I hope not. You all heard that, didn't you? Okay. Paul indicated that in a recent article, uh, Malcolm Wells indicated that the way that people live in the house may indeed be more important than the design of the house itself. Now, Malcolm Wells will respond to that question. It's true. I'm trying to think of the name of a respected mechanical engineer in Philadelphia who wrote an article in the architectural record about 10 years ago proving that very thing. He measured the energy use of uh, two identical side-by-side -side houses, and they varied by a factor of uh, 100%. It really is important, more than insulation or anything. It, it's in how you use the house how many times you flush the toilet, how, how you use hot water, everything, whether you close the doors and the, the whole business. And I, I'm sure that architecture must include training building users to use their buildings properly. Maybe you're working on such thing, but it is terribly important, and it is a part of architecture. And I thank you for reminding me. Uh, I, my host told me earlier that if you had earth-shaking questions, we could uh, work on them here. 
But if you did, if you did not, we would go to Butterfields, where you can talk with Malcolm Wells in a very informal atmosphere. Okay. Yes. Uh, before you leave, you might stroll by on the left-hand side of the stairs and take a look at some of the books that are available. And uh, we'd like for you to buy all of them. Dorothy's running right out to buy as many as she can. Uh, and if there are books there that you are interested in and they have insufficient copies, uh, let us know and we'll see that we can get them to you. Thank you very much for your attention. And wait a minute. It's Linda again. You're not going to leave for this. We just want to invite our special guests from Cincinnati or from out of town to join us at Butterfields. And if you go out in the front, just follow the long train of cars down Tillotson and you'll find your way. No, wait, but there's another question. Um. I'm currently working alone in my woodland hideaway, doing mostly consulting designs for other architects, mostly by mail. I never see the jobs. I also uh, write and sell books and get away with all that. I'm doing a design for a little college on the West Coast, and a uh, design for an underground automobile factory in Connecticut, which is already building and selling $150,000 two-seater cars. You can feel the earth tremble. Yes, sir. Did everybody get that, or do I have to sum it up in three words? Uh, this has to do with whether I feel guilty or not about using all these petroleum-based uh, materials, styrofoam and butyl sheets and I forget what else, but concrete, a lot of things. I do feel terribly guilty about that, and I haven't gone nearly far enough. I'm really a, an overdue bumbler, as you can see, uh, slowly learning a few things. But you're way ahead of me. You're still in school. You can, I mean, you'll have all the answers that I have right now. Well, you have them now. So that you're generations ahead, and you've got to go on from here. They tell me that all of the insulation and waterproofing and plastic materials in my house will be paid for by their resultant energy savings in about two and a half years. But still, it's a petroleum product, and it's not good to use it. I just don't know what else to use at the moment. But there are ways, and you know that every other creature except this one builds without using those things. That's it, folks. Butterfields, next stop.